My name is Joanna Wardlaw and I'm Professor of Applied Neuroimaging at the University of Edinburgh. In Edinburgh there are two areas of strokes that we've been interested in and that I've had a particular involvement in researching and so going back to the early 1990s uh, in those days there were no treatments for stroke and during my days as a medical student and a junior doctor I had worked with some of the cardiologists, the heart doctors, and they were doing some early research studies looking at ways of trying to treat heart attacks. And so I was familiar with some of the methods they were using, drugs to try and get rid of the blood clots in the heart that cause the heart attacks. And so it seemed not an unreasonable question to ask, well, if it works in heart attacks by unblocking the blood vessel, why shouldn't the same approach work in the brain where we know that most strokes are due to a blood clot blocking a blood vessel? And a couple of years ago, we finished a very large trial which many people around the world took part in and which demonstrated conclusively that this clot-busting drug works very effectively and we know much more now about which people are likely to benefit and which people may actually be harmed by the drug and therefore should avoid having it. Where the imaging comes into it, and my interest in this as a, as a radiologist, because my day job is to do scanning and to do diagnoses of stroke, is that these modern scanners are uh, extremely powerful tools. So you can use them to get all sorts of information about what's going on in the brain. So not just about what caused these symptoms, but also about how badly affected is the bit of brain that's involved in the stroke, what's the rest of the brain like, how, how likely is it that this person will be able to make a good recovery from this stroke, are there other things that we need to watch out for that they may particularly run into that we could preempt? The University of Edinburgh and NHS Lothian have joined forces to recreate our brain scanning facility over at our the new Royal Infirmary, which is where the main university medical school and medical research buildings are now based. Improvements in scanning technology over the last 20-25 years have been quite remarkable. Uh, when I first started researching in uh, using brain scanning to research stroke, we mostly used CT scanners, which use x-rays, and they give quite a lot of information, but they don't give much detail about things like function of the brain or underlying chemical reactions. And we very quickly moved on to using magnetic resonance, which is what this scanner here is and magnetic resonance is a really powerful technique. Many people will have had an MR scan um, because it, it's very powerful because it tells you not just very detailed information about the structure of the brain but it can also show the very earliest changes of things starting to go wrong in the brain. It can tell you about the chemical reactions in the brain. It can tell you about um, the wiring connections in the brain and it can tell you about things like blood flow and um, how well your brain is protected from the blood by the blood-brain barrier and it can tell you about the connections and the functional um, components of the brain. So you can use it to study people while they're thinking about something and you can see which parts of the brain light up and are involved in that particular task. So we're, we're about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way towards having the total amount we need for the scanner, but as I said, even very small donations can be really helpful because they can be used to buy a very specific piece of equipment or a very specific component that will make the facility much better, like being able to listen to music while you're in the scanner can really help the scanning process. Um, but it's also... Um, helpful in the sense of morale boosting because when you're engaged in one of these really big projects sometimes it can seem to go on for a very long time and you can think oh well, I'm never going to get there and 
um, you know, even small donations can make you feel, well, actually, this is all very worthwhile. And, and when we were raising money for our first scanner in the late 90s, actually some of the most helpful contributions were some of the smaller ones because they were from highly motivated individuals who might have either had some personal experience themselves or who knew somebody and they were very motivated about wanting to do something to improve the condition of that particular brain disease. So my, my interest that led to me setting up the original research scanner was very much driven by my interest in stroke, which is largely a disease of older people. But from that, we've gone on to become much more interested in other ways in which the brain blood vessels can affect the brain in older people. And from that to uh, disorders such as dementia, but what's really interesting is that looking at the brain in people with either stroke or dementia, it's become very obvious that some of the things that affect your brain when you're older are actually things related to things that might have happened to you when you were much younger. And so one of the emphasis that we're putting on this new facility will be that we're not just studying the brain in older people, but right across the whole life course. So we're going to be able to study the very youngest uh, neonatal new babies, uh, disorders in childhood, um, some of the diseases which tend to affect people in their teens, uh, young adulthood, right across the whole life course, including uh, quite common disorders of midlife like multiple sclerosis, which can be extremely disabling. And this life course approach is really important. It means that we take a much more broad perspective of how the brain functions, how it is affected by disorders, and how it can resist disorders across the entire life course.